been asked to do this. We're going to start at, uh, I suppose, a quick a quick reference to the Molmutine laws of England, which are uh, 450 BC, basically. Um, a, a set of seven very basic laws that uh, effectively um, were predicated on the, the do no ill uh, mentality. Um, uh, they were the first laws of England. Um, we come forward a bit to 1383, 8th of June 1383, and there was a, an interesting juncture in time when the King of England um, is recorded, and it's very well documented, that the King of England gave the land and the pertinences thereto in the kingdom, which at the time was the, the, the whole of the, the, um, the trinity, the trilogy, the uh, or Trinity, the uh, England, Scotland, and Wales. The three kingdoms came under the King of Wales on uh, the 8th of June, 1383. King of Wales at the time, his name was uh, John Foley, his wife's name was Helen. So from that point on, the title um, Lord High Constable was vested in the King of Wales. That meant the Lord High Constable, constabulary being the law of the land, um, and the authority of the land, the lands were governed by the King of Wales and his male-born offspring. The Lord High Admiral, uh, that position was taken up by the, the then King of England. We move forward a bit, we come to 1701 and there was an act, or 1649, Charles I lost his head, then there was a bit of a kerfuffle about who and how they are going to have a king or a queen or a monarch of any sort. And in 1701, the uh, Act of Settlement 1701 UK came about, and what was created was a thing called a constitutional monarchy. Now that meant that the monarch, the king or the queen, was there by virtue of a law created pursuant to the Constitution of England. That law said that, in paragraph 7, that the Crown was not to take its sovereignty outside the dominions of England, Scotland or Ireland without the consent of the Parliament. So there was a very, very clear limitation on what the Sovereign could do with her, his or her sovereignty. They were not allowed to take it outside of England, Scotland or Ireland without the express consent of the Parliament. Now given that we're talking about Admiralty Law, the Parliament would have to give its consent in writing. And that doesn't mean that consent can be assumed, um, it had to be given in writing before it existed. Without consent there was no lawful extension of sovereignty outside of England, Scotland or Ireland. What happened though was that the the, uh, the Crown thought that it would just, and, and the Crown's Admiral thought that they would just continue to uh, conduct themselves in their normal and standard belligerent British manner and they continued to uh, ignore the law that required them to maintain the sovereignty of the Crown within the uh, Three Dominions. In uh, 1788, a chap by the name of Arthur Phillip arrived in a place now called Sydney Cove, and he put a stick in the ground with a rag hanging off it, and he claims that he called, it is claimed, that he claimed the whole of the continent that people refer to as Australia for the Crown of Great Britain. Now the problem with that is that there were a couple of hundred or more sovereign nations on this continent and all that Arthur Philip did at best was maybe um, claim sovereignty over the lands of the people whose lands he put the flag in. All other mobs remained sovereign. They didn't even know that this, this, this knuckle had arrived on this continent, let alone that he has claimed to take sovereignty. Now we've also got to remember that when Arthur Philip came here he had a commission of instruction that instructed him that he was not to interfere with the rights of the indigenous peoples, the native peoples. So by claiming sovereignty he was immediately breaching his orders which meant that he was acting unlawfully, nothing done in breach of law um, can be deemed to be lawful. Can't, there can be no benefit, lawful benefit gained from it. So. That negates any authority or, or benefit, legal benefit, that could be attributed to the Crown or its, its agents as a result of Arthur Philip supposedly taking sovereign uh, title or radical title over the Aurora people's lands. Now, after that occurred, 
um, there was an interesting little um, uh, juncture. Uh, on eight years after Arthur Philip is claimed to have taken sovereignty over all of the lands here, uh, the Judge Advocate General of the First Fleet, David Collins, is recorded in his journal as how he made an entry in, in 1896, 1796 that he uh, was sitting down on a few occasions and had spoken to, to Benelong. And Benelong had explained to him how that the original peoples had their own system of sovereignty and they had their own system of, of title to their lands. And their, their system of title to lands was a, um, a hereditary title. In other words, they could, they could give their land to whoever they wanted to give it to and then upon their death, that land became that person's land. Um, uh, David Collins' journal records that, that uh, Ben Long told him that he was going to leave his lands to his best mate whose name was Boygon. Um, uh, in Judge Advocate General Collins's journal, he also recorded that in 18, 1796, the Aboriginal people maintained their hereditary title over their lands. Now, if Arthur Philip, as the Crown of Australia would tell you, that, um, that uh, Arthur Philip took sovereignty and radical title over the whole continent in 1788, how is it that eight years later, someone in a contemporaneous document wrote that that the original people still held their hereditary title to that date. What makes a further mockery of the Crown's claim, and, I, and the reason I call it the Crown's claim, is I have a letter from the uh, Federal Attorney General's office stating that in 1788, when Arthur Phillip put the flag in Sydney Cove, that is when they claim, this is their claim, this is their legal claim, they claim that that is when the Crown took sovereignty and radical title over the continent. So, our first piece of evidence to counter that and to prove that lie is uh, Judge Advocate General um, Collins' uh, journal entries from nine, eight, uh, 1796. Between 1836 and 1840 there was a commission of inquiry in the House of Commons and that commission of inquiry was looking at um, uh, the interaction between British settlers and Aboriginal people. As a matter of fact, from memory, the commission of inquiry was entitled uh, a commission of inquiry into uh, Aboriginal peoples wherever British settlements were made. Now, the documents that are the record from that inquiry clearly show that there was much argument about whether or not at some point in the future the Crown could extend sovereignty into the British colonies, whether or not they had to treaty with the native peoples, and um, whether or not it would be lawful, um, if they could extend their sovereignty, whether or not it would be lawful to take jurisdiction over the Aboriginal people. Um, there is no question whatsoever, if you read the transcripts or the, the documents available that relate to that, that Commission of Inquiry. There is no doubt that sovereignty had not been taken and the Crown and the Parliament had not considered itself to have taken sovereignty over the colonies at that stage or the lands on the, on the continent. There was a number of things going on by the late 1800s. There was a number of things going on in, in the Pacific Ocean including the, the um, relocating of Canucks from the Pacific Islands uh, to the cane farms in northern New South Wales and Queensland. The Crown got a wind, wind of this and in 18, uh, 1872 they created the uh, Pacific Island Protection Act which detailed how that the, the people, the vessels that were and the captains that were transporting workers were to, to carry bonds and, and hold a bond in relation to the passengers and there had to be a manifest of the passengers and there could be no slave trading. Um, because the admirals, under their admiralty law, and bearing in mind that admiralty law is the law of the sea, it is not the law of the land, the admirals continued to, to ignore the parliament's instruction and continued to breach their own parliamentary instruction and their own law, and they continued to slave trade um, in the Pacific. In 1875, there was an amendment to the Pacific Island Protection Act in order to clarify and make more easy to understand the intent of the parliament. Section 6 of that amendment, and I'll just, I'll read it to you so that we get it, we get it right. Section 6 of the amendment is titled, Power for Her Majesty to exercise jurisdiction over British subjects in the islands of the Pacific Ocean, and to erect a court of justice for, Pacific, uh, sorry, and to erect a court of justice for British subjects in the islands of the Pacific and to make ordinances. And it goes in and it says, It shall be lawful for Her Majesty to exercise power and jurisdiction over her subjects 
within any islands and places in the Pacific, and the Act clarifies the places as being the Australasian colonies, in the Pacific Ocean, not being within Her Majesty's dominions, and Australia wasn't a dominion at that time, wasn't classified by the Crown as a dominion. And it says that, that um, she could go and do certain other things. It shall be lawful for Her Majesty by ordering counsel to create a court of, of, of justice with civil, criminal and admiralty jurisdiction over Her Majesty's subjects within the islands and places. You know, and it keeps talking about how she had jurisdiction over British subjects. The reason for that is all orders given under lettuce patent only apply to British subjects because a lettuce patent do not apply to anyone else and the lettuce patent is the authority that the Crown, uh, by which the Crown vests authority. The interesting part though of that whole act, the whole amendment is section 7. Section 7 is called the saving of the rights of the tribes. Nothing herein or in any such order in council or any law shall be construed to extend, to invest, I shall extend or be construed to extend, to invest her majesty with any claim or title whatsoever to dominion or sovereignty over any such islands or places, and the islands being the Pacific Islands and the places being the Australasian colonies, or to derogate from the rights of the tribes or people inherit, inhabiting such islands or places, or of the rule, chiefs or rulers thereof to such sovereignty or dominion. In other words, the Crown was specifically statute barred or barred by this law, prohibited by this law, from extending or construing to extend sovereignty or dominion into the Australasian colonies or Pacific Islands. Now, when the British settlers here decided that they needed to form some sort of a conglomerate to look after themselves, they created this thing called the Commonwealth. And in, do in doing so, they held a number of uh, constitutional conventions and they settled on a document and the document was later called the Constitution. But when that document was sent to the Home Office in London, um, it was it was amended, and there was a couple of things added to it. And one of the one of the last two passages to go into the the Constitution, section one twenty seven, stated that the Aboriginal natives were not to be counted as a part of the population of the Commonwealth of Australia or any part thereof. So any of the part, states or territories. The reason for that was that the Pacific Island Protection Act amendments of 1875 were still law, and that law, being the oldest law, had to be obeyed by the subordinate law, being the youngest law. And the youngest law, being the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Australia Act, that law had to include a reference to the original people and a reference to our continuing and ongoing sovereignty. Since 1900, or Federation, the thieves who are the ministers within the parliaments of both the states, territories and the Commonwealth itself have used the position of the Commonwealth to unlawfully usurp the sovereign status of the original native peoples and attempt to exercise a form of parliamentary sovereignty um, which, which was their, their ultimate goal. It's taken some 110 years nearly to, to pull this scam off. But they have, by way of manipulation of the Parliament, they have created a corporation called the Commonwealth of Australia and the State of New South Wales and the State of Victoria, etc., etc. And all these Brigolo corporations are merely fronts for slave traders um, who are the ministers and the others who are a party to that scam, that corporate Commonwealth and State scam. The Aboriginal people have never ceded sovereignty. Our, our, our people will not cede sovereignty. In 1967 there was a referendum and all of the British subjects who were here in Australia on this continent, they voted to amend their constitution, the law that makes reference to them, and they decided they would remove from that law a passage of text that made a reference to the original peoples. They're removing a section of their law in as much as that section spoke about the sovereign native peoples. That removal of that section does not remove from the native peoples their right to sovereignty over their lands and themselves. That is a, is a fiction that has been put forward by the Crown um, and the parliaments of the Commonwealth and the states and territories to fraudulently usurp the sovereign status of the original peoples. That, that is all that has happened. 
The Commonwealth of Australia is a corporation registered in the Securities Exchange Commission in Washington, D.C. Um, it, is, it is a corporation that holds slaves. It's like the corporation of the state of New South Wales who holds its slaves through their birth certificates. That's another story. It's, 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 it's not too involved, but it's a different story, and I can't go off on that tangent. But suffice to say that the only hope that Australians have, and I hate, I, I love my land, but I hate the connotation of the word Australia because to be an Australian means that you are owned by the Commonwealth of Australia and you are therefore a slave. We are not the free country. We are quite the antithesis of the free country. Um, we're not the lucky country anymore because our par parliamentarians have stolen our birthright and they have squandered it. Stop and consider it for a second. Our government isn't selling our natural resources or isn't borrowing against our natural resources. They are selling our natural resources to the highest bidder. So when they borrow, what other stock and chattel do they possess that they can borrow against other than your and my ability to work? That means that they're borrowing against our, our, uh, our sweat. They're borrowing against us. They can't borrow against us if they don't own us. You think that they don't own you? Explain to me then why it is that docs can come and take your children. Explain to me why they can take your children if they don't own your children. Why can they force your children to attend a schooling system that they know is doing nothing other than dumbing our children down? Why is it they can force you to mass medicate your children and yourself if they don't own your children, if they don't own you? How can a parliament, if you're a sovereign person, how can your parliament tell you what to do? And if you are a sovereign person, when are you responsible for your own actions? If someone else has to take that responsibility and dole that responsibility out to you through a court. Under traditional law, things were dealt with much quicker they were dealt with on the spot. Um, we, we, need, we need to go back to our law. If there are people who don't wish to come with us, okay, fine, not a problem. But it's about time in this country, Australians boast that they, they like the truth and they want to live on the truth and live under the truth. Well then, the truth is that the, the British law that currently um, is resident in this land is a fraud that all those people who uphold that law, are, up, that law are, are upholding a fraud. It's clear fact. Um, show me the document. Show me the, the document that ascribes title from this land to the British. Their own law prohibited them from, from taking it. Their own law prohibited them from extending their sovereignty into this land. So how did they to bring their sovereignty here? Under what lawful mechanism? And by what uh, certificate or instrument of title did they gain title from our elders, from our ancient peoples? How did they do this? Surely, if, if this happened legally and lawfully, there is a record of it somewhere. Who has got that record? Can we please see the kangaroo skin with the iconology on it that shows where our people, in full knowledge of what they were doing, handed over authority over our lands? Because the laws of England prohibited it the English law from being brought into this country. And if you want to go into their courts, into the British courts, their law is their Bible. That is where their law comes from. And if you doubt that, consider this. We have God, the Archbishop. The Archbishop coronates or ordains the Queen, gives her her authority to be the Queen over the Parliament, who presides over the law, create the law that the courts exercise um, with the assistance of the police who control the people. Now, if you don't think that you're living under a, 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 uh, a secular religious law when you live under British statute law, then you can't see the wood for the trees. The fact is that all British law is church law. It comes from the Church of England. The Queen is the keeper of the faith. Yeah? How can she be the keeper of the faith looking upwards to her God whilst not at the same time looking downwards and using her status as the keeper of the faith to maintain control over the people through the parliament and the courts. It has to be a system of um, Christian religious law. If you are not a Christian, 
if you are an original sovereign person, you are not subject to that ethos, you are not subject to that church law. If you are not a Christian, period, just not a Christian, you are not subject to that law. And it's about time that the Christians really realise that if they are so full of peace and love and, and understanding and that their God is so all high and mighty, surely they would understand that their own law says when you go into someone's country, obey the law of the land until that law transgresses the law of God. Our laws are based on the pre precedent of do no harm. The laws of the Bible are based on a very similar precedent of do no harm. So can you explain to me how it is that our law, the law of this land, which was obviously the law before the whites brought, the, white, white, the British brought their, their um, uh, Christian law with them, why is it that our law has been overridden by a law that says that the their overriding law can't override our law if our law doesn't offend their law. Which sounds a bit complicated, but I'll put it another way. How can they, how can they bring you their, their secular law here when their law says they can't bring it here if our law doesn't offend their law? And our law does not offend their law. Now, it might sound a bit convoluted and a bit tricky, but it's not. 